Christina Brown. You're watching Our Take and welcome to our debut show where we hope to share the perspectives and points of view from women around the world. And join me, please, here online and on Facebook, Twitter, and let's share our take. And with me today is guest host Kelly Goff. Kelly is an author. She is a blogger, a special correspondent for TheRoot.com. Thank you so much, Kelly, for being here on the debut show. I'm Welcome. so excited to be here for your first show. It's really an exciting time. Uh, I hope we have a lot of fun. You and I always do. I know we do. <laughs> and I know you're not shy, so feel free to jump in and ask questions to all of our guests. We have a lot to talk about today. Uh, topping our daily take is, of course, Trayvon Martin, the second week of jury selection in a Florida courtroom where the family of Trayvon Martin seeks justice and accused murderer George Zimmerman hopes for freedom. But as a nation, we get to see that in this case, well, it isn't quite black and white race, that is. Our take continues coverage of the killing of Trayvon Martin, the trial of George Zimmerman. George Zimmerman is pleading not guilty to second-degree murder. He claims when he shot and killed 17-year-old Martin, it was in self-defense. Prosecutors and defense attorneys are seeking a pool of 40 potential jurors who have been screened for any influence of pretrial publicity before they move on to the second round of questioning. And Kelly, it seems like when it comes to trying to find people who haven't heard or haven't come up with their own opinion about this case, it seems like that would be nearly impossible. Impossible. Yeah. I have no idea. I mean, because the thing is, I'm thinking if someone knows nothing about this case, is that some, someone who's actually qualified to serve on a jury right. either? Yeah, you're right? wondering what, what rock have they been under for the past <laughs> exactly. year? Exactly. Yeah. So that seems a little odd, too. And I, and I also think, too, that when it comes to this case, it, it, when you hear some of the opinions about whether the, the presumed innocence or guilt of George Zimmerman, it's as though people are already approaching the case with their own history, their of own course. experience, their own baggage, as opposed to really examining what what happened? Well, here's what I find fascinating about our jury selection process in America. I remember once I was up to possibly be on a jury for a particular trial, and it had to do with assault. And I looked at sort of the person accused, and I looked at the woman doing the accusing, and I just felt in my heart uncomfortable. Do you know what I mean, Christina? I felt like there's just something that made me so sympathetic towards this woman, and I happened to actually be honest about mm -hmm. that. And I ended up not getting selected, but I remember thinking to myself, maybe I was too... Like, my point is, if everyone is honest about the baggage that we all bring from our own stories, our own upbringings, our own what have you, then would we ever actually have a jury? And does that mean that our jur juries are ending up with the people who aren't being entirely forthright about their biases, right? And we've already and kind of seen that where this case is concerned. It, you know, last week there was a, a, a juror who claimed that he didn't know much about it, only to find out that he had posted uh, a number of different messages and posts on his Facebook page, as, as though he was eager to get right. on this jury. I think that this, this we're going to see sort of shades of O.J. Simpson here in yeah. terms of people don't like to acknowledge a lot of the, the subliminal uh, racial uh, messages that affect our perspective, right? And I mean, they, remember they had that Harvard test where you could test to see, I'm not explaining it well, but how quickly you sort of shoot, like, as if you're a police officer. And there is a sort of knee-jerk reaction when a brown face appeared. And so there are all these things that we can't get at just by someone doing jury selection that are going to influence how someone behaves on a jury. And I think that these are the types of things we should be concerned about. Well, a little later in the show, we're actually going to be speaking with someone who says that when it comes to this case, it's really about the women, which is kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have a defendant who's a man, we have a suspect, uh, a suspect who's a man, the victim is a man. but. Uh, one attorney says it's about the women in this case, it's about the judge, it's about the special prosecutor, it's about the mother, uh, Sabrina Fulton, of Trayvon Martin. And so that in and of itself kind of throws another uh, monkey layer. wrench, if, if, if you will, or layer uh, to the story. As yeah, well. I think it's fascinating because on the one hand, uh, I know that there was a Huffington Post blogger who wrote this, I mean, it's an incredibly heart-wrenching piece titled Black, Woman's, Black Mother's Burden. And it's about, you know, what it's like to be the mother of a black son and dealing with a story like this and talking to him about a story like this. But on the flip side, you have a mother who's going to be on that jury who might see Trayvon as her son. On the other hand, there are plenty of women who see young black men and they see danger. Yeah. And so I just kind of wonder how those two sides are going to play out in a jury room.
And speaking of uh, jury rooms, we go from a Florida courtroom to an Indiana parole room. An Indiana woman is actually getting a second chance at freedom. Paula Cooper was 16 years old back in 1985 when she was sentenced to death row for the brutal murder of her Bible school teacher. She stabbed 78-year-old Ruth Pelkey more than 30 times. In 1988, Indiana Supreme Court set aside the death sentence, ordering Cooper to serve 60 years. Today, she is scheduled to walk free. Kelly, I have to tell you, when this story first came to my attention in our editorial meeting earlier today, my initial response was, no way. It's not to say that I am not someone who is for redemption, but when I knew, when I came to understand the circumstances leading to this woman's death, this woman was Paula's Bible school, uh, Bible school teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, Paula was accused of pretending to That's want right. to uh, do Bible study, and she and a few friends of hers attacked this woman. And I was just appalled at the possibility that she gets a second chance. What ultimately changed my mind, at least to a little bit, is the knowledge that the grandson of the victim has actually come to be a friend mm -hmm. of Paula, has developed a relationship with her, and actually supports her mm -hmm. having the chance at a second, second life, if you will, a life from behind bars. And I guess that softens the blow, but... It's still a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, you know, I'm actually, this is one of my sort of uh, embarrassing little secrets. I, I love those Discovery ID women's crime pro programs. <laughs> I know it's one of those kind of embarrassing little secrets. But I watched the story on this case. That's how I learned about it actually several months ago because they did an episode on it. And I think there is an argument to be made that perhaps a teenager should not be sentenced to death. I do not think that there is an argument to be made that someone who stabbed someone over 30 times unprovoked mm -hmm. um, is not a danger to society. Someone who does that unprovoked, I mean, I, I don't, there has to be something under, the only possible exception I could even consider considering is if someone perhaps had mental health issues and someone said, look, if she stays on medication, this will never happen again. But do we know what was sort of going on inside to make someone do something that heinous? I don't feel safe knowing that this woman's out in society, and I'm happy her grandson has found some measure of redemption, but that's not how what dictates our judicial process. Yeah. And I really find it disturbing that this woman's going to be out. I think that there is no, I think doing something like that, you forfeit your right to live with the, among the rest of us. And that's my opinion. I mean, I, we can only hope that they turn out to be right, because... There have been times when people have been paroled and they haven't been. And lucky and for her, we weren't on her parole board. Right? Yes, that's very true. Well, in, in other news, this one I think you might find interesting at best. An economist says the days of women being more eager to marry than men are actually <laughs> shrinking. Nancy Fulbright points to a recent poll of unmarried blacks that found only 25% of women were actually seeking long-term relationships compared with 43% of men. Looking at marriage like an economist. She actually suggests that these days each spouse encounters costs and benefits from the arrangement and economic opportunities for women actually figure into the equation. Yep. Fulbright says, quote, look at you, Kelly, you're nodding. You're like, I agree. I <laughs> Amen. agree. Amen. She says, if the supply of women who wants to marry decreases, the terms of marriage move in the favor of women, saying they're likely to receive a larger share of joint income and leisure time. Husbands, on, on the other hand, become more likely to, more likely to relinquish some decision-making power and do more housework and child care. Well, I'm all for that part. <laughs> I look, I, I am not that surprised by this. You actually found the story funny. I did find this story really funny because, you know, I was saying, uh, well, look, well, there are a couple reasons. Number one, I don't think it's that shocking because fundamentally marriage really used to be about economic security and particularly for women in the days when we weren't able to go out and be in the workforce like right. you and I are today. Yeah. And so now we outnumber men at colleges, uh, single women who don't have children actually out earn or out earning young 20 something men. So that kind of, and, and yet working women who are married still end up doing more of the housework. So you combine <laughs> all that, I don't really see the upside. I mean, you know, and so I, look, I think that stable nuclear families are great for society, but 
I think that there are some of us who kind of go, okay, well, if you have your own health insurance and you're, you're not having kids imminently, what's the upside? Right. What do I need you for? <laughs> I, mean, I have my own health insurance. What have you done for me so, lately? I mean, right? I like what that. Do I, mean? I pay for my own health insurance, you know. Well, this is, a, <laughs> this is a very important story, too, that we want to get to. And I understand this is something that you were actually considering um, participating in, and that's Blogging Wild Brown. But before we get to that, I have to talk about one of my favorite aspects of this show, and that is the use of social media. Yay! We are actually inviting you to be social with us. Follow today's conversation online at hashtag our take arise. I'm going to say that one more time. Hashtag our take arise. Hint, hint. Tweet me. <laughs> I'm committed to having the voice of women and men around the world join in the discussion. And what better way than through the blogosphere? So during the hour, please tweet us at Our Take Arise TV. And speaking of blogosphere, this week, the sixth annual Blogging Wild Brown Conference gets underway here in New York City at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And joining us in our daily take this morning is Blogging Wild Brown founder Gina McCall. Holly on Skype live from Austin, Texas. Good morning to you, Gina. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Blogging Wild Brown, it's, it's interesting. Kelly and I were actually talking about this this morning. She was talking about uh, her interest in attending the conference and possibly even attending it uh, while it's here in New York. First of all, tell me a little bit about the title, where that came from. I love the story behind Blogging Wild Brown. Um, actually, uh, there was a gathering of bloggers. Can you, are you hearing an echo? No, I hear you just fine, Gina. Okay, well, there was a gathering of bloggers in uh, New York City, maybe 2007, with uh, President Bill Clinton at his offices in Harlem. And in that picture of progressive bloggers, there were no people of color of wow. any, any kind. Everyone in the picture was white. Wow. And it was ironic because this gathering was taking place in Harlem. And so there was a blogger named Terrence of the Republic of Tea who wrote a post called Blogging While Brown. And that's where the name came from. But back when I started blogging in April of 2007, um, once, I, once you become a blogger, you start to meet other bloggers. And bloggers have... have a unique set of issues that are common between us. And many of them were complaining about some of the larger uh, social media conferences and technology conferences and participation by bloggers of color um, as speakers or even highlighting their existence at all. Because 2007 was a lot different. There, there was a question about whether or not black people actually use technology. Of course we did. We just didn't necessarily get acknowledged. And now no one would question that based on uh, the participation of black people in things like Twitter and Facebook and those types of things. So back then, my response was instead of complaining about conferences where you don't feel welcome or acknowledged, why don't you start your own conference? And like that, it was an impulsive decision. And here we are six years later and we're going to be in New York City. And Gina, at this conference, what are some of the things that uh, the bloggers are, are, are learning, getting a chance to, uh, to do that is uh, so important and specific to the fact that they are minority bloggers? Well, that's really interesting because the content of our technical courses isn't any different. Um, it's stellar. Our speakers are all stars, um, highly educated subject matter experts in digital media technology and social media. And so the content of the technical sessions isn't any different than what you'd find at another conference. I say it's even better uh, because the technical skills you need to blog are the same no matter what race you are. I think what you will find is when these bloggers walk into a room at our conference, they will walk into a room with people who look exactly like them. They won't be the only one in the room. They won't be the oddball out. Every speaker at the conference will look like them. Um, and we certainly have um, we certainly have panels that are about issues that are specific to the African American community. But the overall uh, conference content is about the same struggles that every blogger has. It's just that the people who are the subject matter experts at the conference look like you, and it's a family-friendly environment. It's also an opportunity for us to get together with people who are already in our social networks. And so it's a family reunion and a continuing education opportunity and a networking opportunity. I would say some things that are unique to black bloggers 
are the same challenges that every other type of media owner faces, which is access to capital and access to networks. And mm -hmm. so one of the great things about the conference, it's a great way for these bloggers to network with brands and organizations who want to connect to them. But it, it, there's no such thing as black social media from a technical standpoint. <laughs> Twitter is Twitter, no matter who is using it. It's just what we choose to do with it. Gina, you know, I get asked this all the time because I'm a blogger and I, I always kind of am careful because I think this answer might d depend on who's doing the asking, but I would love to ask you since you are the queen blogger. Um, <laughs> blog <laughs> um, what do you say to people when they ask, uh, should they have maintain their own blog or should they start blogging for another site? I get that question all the time and I always worry that I give someone the wrong answer. There, there's not a wrong answer. Okay. Um, it, it, it depends on what works, works best for you. I, I have, I've always hit, run my own blog, but I also have freelance for bigger sites. I think one of the benefits of freelancing for a bigger site is that you tend to get a larger audience. It's a way to grow your own brand. But I personally prefer not to have an editor. I don't tend to like to write on demand. Um, but I don't think that I don't think that it, it just depends on what works for you. A great thing that you need to always remember as a blogger is that the benefit of blogging is that you own your content and yeah. you own your own platform. And when you write for someone else, you don't own that content. You That's not your platform. And I think every person, whether you're a blogger or an author or someone who's a reporter, writer, should always have a home base um, of operations online. Do you, do you think that... I really feel like the, the Genesis story was sort of, from my vantage point, what sort of put black bloggers on the map in terms of mainstream media, appreciating that we exist and we matter and we have a voice that should be listened to. Do you sort of, do you think that too? I mean, for those who don't know, I'm talking about the Genesis case in Louisiana where a number of um, African-American teenagers were frankly treated with what many, most people consider a, a grave injustice in terms of sentencing. I think what happened was that definitely the, the Genesis 6 was kind of the emergence of online activism. Color of Change was at the center of that. That was kind of the first time that an organization that wasn't a traditional black uh, civil rights organization was that was spearheading that, and that definitely. But you also have to remember the Genesis 6 also happened right before uh, then Senator Barack Obama declared his presidency. Right. Uh, his candidacy for president of the United States. And I think the fact that a black man was running for president probably had the biggest impact on the explosion of black bloggers. I, I know we're out of time, but I just wanted to say, because for those who don't know, black bloggers actually staged a blog-in where a lot of people wrote about the Genesis case on the same day. And that's what really got the mainstream media, CNN, and everyone to pay attention. So, and, and we appreciate uh, having you, uh, Gina McCauley, joining us from Texas. Uh, the name of the conference is Blogging While Brown. And shameless plug here, we're <laughs> online as well. <laughs> Go to Facebook and Twitter. You can follow us at Twitter at or at. Our Take Arise TV. And remember to like and leave comments on our Facebook page, Our Take on Arise TV. And of course, you are watching Our Take on Arise TV.